It's been four years almost to the day of Final Fantasy VII Remake's release, a game which was quite divisive among fans of the series. I came away from Remake about 50-50. It done some things right, the general combat being one of the most interactive in modern Final Fantasy. It also allowed characters to be actual expressive characters and not just emotionless sticks. But it also done some things wrong, like party members being absolutely worthless without your input, side quests being bad, level design being overly linear, and feeling quite restricted in how quests are designed around the restrictive level design. So, with Rebirth being out, did they listen to the feedback? Did they make any meaningful changes to the systems laid out in Remake? Let's go over it. Let's start with probably the biggest change or addition, however you want to categorize this. The game is now open world, or open area with connections, I should say. This is a massive improvement over Remake's linear hallway design. No more are you just pushing left stick forward to the waypoint. And for me, it never once got overwhelming. When I say that each area has a lot of content, I mean it. This game has such an insane breadth of content to fill out these areas, and most of it isn't reskinned content or content you've done 15 hours prior. No, it's content that's entirely unique to this game. Let's take Junon as an example. After a certain point here, you'll come across a side quest from some frogs. Turns out, these frogs are children in an area that turns people to frogs. If you do the side quest, you'll eventually unlock a mini game. It's essentially four guys, but with frogs. This game is full of content like this. Unique assets, unique mini games. It's honestly a miracle that this game was made in four years. I went into this game as blind as possible. So when I saw the tower that reveals stuff mechanic, I kind of had a PTSD flashback to playing a Ubisoft game from the last few years. But it was absolutely fine, honestly. It's daunting at first and does have the characteristics of being a checklist open world game but the content it reveals is either fun or always placed conveniently on the way to the next tower or on the way to the main story objective. Now that I've brought it up I should probably talk about what you will find in these areas and what the towers actually reveal. The towers reveal enemy variants which are as the name implies a variation of an existing enemy from that area. From what I remember though, these enemies don't really have that much of a different strategy than the normal version, but it's just a fun thing to fight so there's no use complaining. The second and my personal favourite is the livestream crystals. At first you'll think these just serve as a way to unlock more of Chadley's VR combat missions, but if you scan enough of them it will spawn a unique monster to fight that's kind of like a mini boss. And finally, you will find mog stools one in every region. Here you will only ever find pain and demon spawn. By the way, I, I want to quickly rant about Moogles in this game. What were they thinking? And yes, I do know that this design was in Remake, but most people never noticed it because the Moogle was hard to see. These demons are absolutely gross. It's as though they never even tried to make a Moogle design, and they just went with something to be different. And here's the thing that annoys me the most. Final Fantasy VII series already has an existing Moogle design, and it's fine. I just don't understand this change at all. Not a single soul likes it. And don't even get me started on the minigame to upgrade the store for each region. The first couple are fine, but then it introduces a timer and eventually blocks to where you can go. How this minigame works is that you've got five Moogles being absolute shitheads, and you have to guide them back to the house in the middle. Here's the issue. For the most part, you have zero direct control over how the Moogles move. You can sometimes direct them to a hazard which knocks them out for a time, but that's it. It's just a frustrating minigame because you'll get into position, see a hazard come towards you off screen, then you move out of the way, then you accidentally push the Moogle in the opposite direction. Speaking on minigames though, this game has a lot of minigames. It's got to be... 20 plus or something. Most of them can easily fall into the realm of tedious or even annoying. But here's the thing, most mini games in this game are completely optional. You do not have to engage with them. And the ones that are present in the main story are simplified versions of the optional ones. There was one though that 
really frustrated me. And it was the end of chapter 8. You're escaping in the buggy, and as Barrett, you need to shoot enemies as they spawn. Seems simple enough, right? Wrong. The control scheme for this is absolutely horrendous. So, to start, for whatever reason, aim is left stick, which already messes with my brain. But then you use the right stick to move left and right. Okay, that seems fine. But then you realize that square is to shoot, which means you need to take your right thumb off of moving the buggy to shoot. Apart from R1 to reload, no other button was used. So why couldn't shoot be put on R2 for this, like it would in any other shooting game. For a bit of context, the only way to be able to use all of these inputs at once would be to use claw grip, which is, in my opinion, somewhat awkward to use. But apart from that and the Moogle minigame, they're mostly fine. Again, most of them are optional and are not required to beat the game. But I think that's a testament to the game's overall design. The game has two paths, is how I would describe it. On the left path, is the main story. You can go down this path and never once interact with anything that's not the main objective. On the other path is all of the side content. This has the side quests, the proto relic quest line, VR combat missions, and all manner of other things to do. To me, these two paths are separate. The side content specifically all having its own storylines and high quality voice acting, animations, writing, etc. It kind of reminds me of Baldur's Gate 3 almost, where all the side content and stories were just as high quality as the main quest. Only difference is that in Rebirth, this side content doesn't circle back to enhance the main story like it does in Baldur's Gate. Next I want to talk about the gameplay, and I have a lot to say about this. And when I say gameplay, I mean combat specifically. And if you've seen my remake video, which is linked below if you haven't, a lot of my complaints persist. If you don't want to watch that video, my issues boil down to AI party members being really annoying and just bad. And I forgot to mention this back then, but the air combat was absolutely dreadful. Rebirth gameplay is very 50-50 for me. On one hand, they've made a decent number of improvements and changes, while on the other, some things have been left unchanged or they've added things in an attempt to improve which has the opposite effect. Let me start with the improvements. Unfortunately, this really only applies to Cloud. The other existing characters have improvements or changes too, but you can tell that Cloud got all the love. So one of the big issues of Remake was that air combat was horrifically bad. You would kind of just go up into the air, stay in place, attack three times, then come back down. You had little to no control. In Rebirth, they changed it. So now if a character is in the sky, they can stay up there at all times. It's great, I remember seeing a clip of this sometime last year, in 2023, fighting the water boss under Junon, and I remember thinking that it didn't look great. It looked quite tedious and slow, but man, wh whoever was playing for that clip, they did not do it justice at all. Cloud can get up in the air by dodging and attacking soon after. If you press square, you'll attack sending out projectiles. And if you hold square, you'll lunge towards the enemy. It honestly feels really good. I'm not quite sure how they can improve upon Cloud's gameplay for part 3. Tifa is another character who can stay in the sky. She doesn't get in the sky as easily as Cloud. You need to use a synergy skill for another party member to propel her upwards. Tifa is just as fun as she was in Remake, she's still an absolute god at staggering and getting that stagger percentage up. Now, the other characters I didn't really play with, I just didn't care to unless I was forced to for story reasons. Aerith was my main mage for most of the game. Her gameplay is centred around wards and staying in them to get buffs, which is annoying because of how slow she is and she has to keep moving a lot. Aerith didn't get many core changes, which is really disappointing because all they really had to do is make her attack a little bit faster. Her ATB gain rate is abysmal. She's a fine mage and buffer slash debuffer for a while, and that is until you get Yuffie. Yuffie didn't get many changes to her gameplay loop, if any at all, but man, she is far and away the most fun character to play as. 
she plays pretty much the exact same way she does an intermission, just with some new weapon abilities. Notably, Doppelganger. This summons an entity that follows Yuffie and every action and input you do. And lastly, for characters that were playable in Remake, Barret. Once again, I barely touched him, unless the story forced me to. He already didn't feel all that great in Remake, and he didn't get many changes. Rebirth also has two new characters being playable, Kate Sith and Red 13. I played as both every now and then, but they were just kind of meh, honestly. Kate Sith is very dependent on the luck stat to get the desired benefits from his abilities. Plus, all his power comes from when you have the Moogle out. I don't know, I didn't play him much. I didn't really vibe with his gameplay, honestly. Now, Red 13. Oh, love that guy. His role is more of a tank. The more you block damage, the more you build the vengeance gauge, which is kind of like a, a Super Saiyan form, I guess. The problem with Red 13 is that it always felt like something was missing from his kit. His basic combo didn't feel like it had a finisher, if that makes sense. You can hold square to do a spin attack, which increases the stagger gauge, but that's it. All of these characters have access to synergy attacks, which are special abilities you can use by filling up a bar when you use some weapon abilities. The two characters who perform this synergy attack will get a buff that ranges from longer stagger time, 3 ATB gauges, unlimited MP, and raises limit break level by 1. These are really nice, but I can't help but feel like these are far more useful in hard mode because I barely use them on normal. I never really felt like I needed to use them. Most of the time, I could stagger enemies and bosses pretty fast and kill them within that stagger. Another new system they added was the Folio system. This replaces the weapon skill trees from Remake. You get some minor stat upgrades here, but this is where you get the synergy stuff from. Every character also has access to an ability that lets them use a minor elemental spell. Not anything too amazing, just if you need to use some elemental damage to pressure an enemy and for some reason you have no materia equipped, which if you're playing properly, you should. I'm going to be real, I think this folio system is a pure downgrade from Remake's weapon skill trees. The progression through this felt really slow at times. I remember multiple times thinking about how I haven't unlocked any nodes in the last few days or chapters. It makes me wonder if this system was added later in development because the menus are kind of confusing. In the party screen there's an option to upgrade weapons and then all you can do is equip weapon abilities you unlocked from the folios tree. I guess it's technically correct in that you are upgrading your weapon but it still felt a bit off, especially early game when you're still messing around with the systems. One of my biggest gripes with Remake was that your party members were absolutely useless unless you controlled them. They would just stand around holding guard waiting for you to input a command for them. Unfortunately, nothing has changed. Party members still do nothing most of the time and it's really frustrating because it's such an easy fix. But the developer's idea of a fix is to make us waste precious materia slots on materia for the chance for AI to use abilities. And I don't know man, I'm not asking for a full on gambit system like 12, I just want these characters to be a bit more competent while I focus on the actions of one character. As an example, if I'm playing Tifa and hard focusing on stagger or getting the stagger percentage up, then the characters I'm currently not focused on should be using their arsenal. I'm not saying they have to use everything perfectly and correctly, but at the same time, having a party member buff and debuff be a choice between magnify or auto is kind of ridiculous. And that's all I have to say for gameplay really. Overall, love the improvements, but the core system still have leftover issues from Remake. Lastly is the story. I'm conflicted on this. On one hand, this is a review. I should be reviewing the story, but on the other hand, the story is incomplete. Not incomplete in the way of how sequels usually work, but we are currently two thirds of the way through the entire story. I don't think it's fair for me to critique or praise. Part 3 might end up fumbling hard and do things that end up making Remake and Rebirth story dumb in hindsight. 
So instead, I'm going to talk about the presentation of the story and how it's laid out for us over actually critiquing the story and the new additions. It's no secret that this remake project is changing the story or at the very least making additions to the existing story. And the way part one went about this was, in my opinion, quite poor. The scene that has stuck with me these last couple of years because of how bad it was is when you're in President Shinra's office and for some reason Sephiroth appears and kills Barrett. But this is entirely for gameplay reasons so that you don't have Barrett in the boss fight because immediately after the boss, the whispers just revive Barrett. There's other cases too, like when Sephiroth appears pretty much right away. I've seen a lot of people really heavily dislike that and I'm one of those. Remake was just a little bit too on the nose with portraying to us this isn't the Final Fantasy 7 people know and love. In my opinion, Rebirth does this a lot better with how it presents the story new and old. It doesn't feel like a metal bat to the back of the head over and over hoping you understand. A bit of a disclaimer, I've never finished the original 7. I got to Nibelheim, opened the safe with the mini boss and it destroyed me. And apparently I hadn't saved in a long time and it sent me all the way back to Cosmo Canyon and I just haven't found the time to go back to it yet. But based on what I know and what I remember, Rebirth is a lot more respectful to the story and more importantly the player. Let's take the events of Cosmo Canyon as an example. Just like in the original, you still have Bugenhagen explaining how the planet and Marco works, you still have Red 13's trial. Everything from the original game is intact. They haven't changed anything, it's all additive. So once again, let's take Red 13's trial. From what I remember, the visuals are a bit different, but the content and outcomes are still the same. You still fight Guy Natak at the end, just like the original. You still get the Seto scene almost entirely unchanged and a shot for shot remake of the original. But after the Seto scene, instead of it cutting to everyone around a campfire, we get an interaction with Gi and the Tuck and we get a lore dump on the Gi and then we're given a task to bring the Gi the black materia. Things like this don't detract from the original story. This is how part one should have been. There's some things towards the end that I've seen people upset about, but right now things like this are just subjective. We don't know exactly what's going on. This is why I don't feel right in reviewing the story in its current state. I guess what people want to know is whether or not the story is good. Yes, I loved every second of it. I've never been more locked in than I was with Reba. If they somehow fumble part three, it will be a generational fumble. This is the end of my review. I don't give out review scores. I give out recommendations. So what do I recommend that you do for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth? buy it. Maybe not necessarily buy a PS5 for this as it, as its exclusivity runs out in May 2024, but when you have the opportunity to buy it and play it, yes, 100% buy it. For the people who were put off or didn't like the direction Remake went, this applies to you too, because I was in the same boat as you. I know that I'm a nobody. Most people will not see this video. You don't have to trust me. I don't expect you to. I have to earn that trust from the people that watch these videos. But in my opinion, Rebirth is what you were looking for in Remake. 